I think it's important to just remember uh, 2022, both uh, not just for the yeah, massive failures, but also for all the yeah, amazing technological and adoption backdrops that we've had. And uh, I think even the first inklings of cryptocurrency and uh, blockchain spaces ability to like, actually have very significant positive impacts on the world. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with Dave Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Ethereum in 2023. Best guest to talk about this, Vitalik Buterin on the podcast today. We talk about what in the Ethereum application ecosystem, it's the title of his blog post, what excites Vitalik going into 2023. And a lot of optimism dropped in this episode that you got to stay tuned for. Uh, before we get in, first, a little bit of housekeeping for Bankless listeners. We are revamping our sponsor strategy uh, going into the next year, and we're going to be putting a focus more on the sponsors and the projects and uh, the companies that are playing long-term games in crypto. And so we're excited to be building out a strategic relationship with, with Kraken. Um, the reason David and I like Kraken is because they're one of the few crypto exchanges that didn't rug us last year, right, David? Yeah. They've also implemented proof of reserves before anyone ever asked them to. So they have been leading the frontier of centralized crypto exchanges that can use cryptography to check themselves. Uh, and so implementing proof of reserves before they were asked to just indicates that Jesse and the rest of the Kraken team are here to do good by crypto uh, and to leverage the powers that make crypto awesome. So thank you, Kraken, for sponsoring this. And we're excited to build out a strategic relationship with Kraken in 2023. A few things to look out for in this episode, as always. Number one, why Vitalik thinks our villains are getting worse, actually worse. Uh, every single cycle, um, this being the maybe the worst cycle of villains of all. Number two, why he plans to say Ethereum rather than crypto moving forward in 2023 to describe the industry instead of applications um, built on top of it. Number three, why he thinks simple DeFi good, complicated DeFi bad. There's a lot mm -hmm. of nuance to that take that we get into. Uh, number four, how he thinks Ethereum can actually solve the internet's big bad identity problem. How do you determine who are the bots and who are the humans? How do you keep identity decentralized? Vitalik's actually bullish that Ethereum has a massive role to play there. And finally, his answer to the question, what is Ethereum's most scalable use case? That's an answer, David. I don't think either you or I expected. You'll have to stay tuned for that in the episode as well. What should people pay attention to as we dive in here? I think the big question that is the overarching theme about this episode is how proliferated are some of the use cases that many, many people, and definitely us, talk about? Uh, for example, DAOs. How, how much of a Cambrian explosion will there be with DAOs? How many DeFi apps are there actually going to be? Are there going to be as many DeFi apps as there are websites? Or are there just going to be a few DeFi apps? How many DAOs are there going to be? Uh, and I, this is one of the conversations that we start off this, this podcast with Vitalik. He gives the example of Esperanto, a esoteric language that was meant to be a universal language for everyone to adopt that would help support glo global peace. And then also Linux, a fantastic technology with a medium amount of adoption in some specific cases uh, versus the internet, which is the most adopted piece of technology of all time. How much of crypto adoption will there be in contrast to these three anchor points? And what can we do to help make crypto be adopted as much as the internet and not be left to some esoteric hobbyist group who thinks the Esperanto language is cool? Uh, and so we talk about this frame of reference in the application layer, in the DAO layer, uh, and the identity layer, and how Ethereum can really change the game and hopefully how we can uh, move the needle in 2023 and look back on 2022 and take some of the lessons out of 2022 to make sure that we uh, don't repeat them, Ryan. Look, guys, every episode with Vitalik is a must listen. This is certainly no exception. And David, I'm excited to explore some of those topics with you in the debrief as well. That's the show we record after the show for our premium members. And uh, in that, David, I think um, I want to talk to you about this idea of crypto maybe being a niche versus mm -hmm. going mainstream, something like the internet. And also this theme that Vitalik kept coming back to in this episode, which was we actually have a role to play. Yes. We can make crypto bigger and better, and we can actually build towards a future where crypto is a technology adopted like the internet and not just some uh, esoteric niche. So uh, we'll be talking about that in the debrief too. Guys, we're going to get right to our episode with Vitalik. But before we do, 
we want to tell you about these tools to help you go bankless. The Brave Wallet is your secure multi-chain on-ramp into Web3, and it's built directly into the Brave privacy browser. Gone are the days of managing multiple wallet extensions that put you at risk of phishing, spoofs, and tracking. With the Brave Wallet, you can securely manage your crypto assets across more than 100 different chains, including Ethereum, Layer 2s, Solana, and more, all without downloading risky extensions. The Brave Wallet is easy to set up and removes the headache of jumping between wallets and extensions. It's lightweight, but packed with great features like built-in token swaps, buying and holding NFTs with a gallery view, and support for hardware wallets. But also much more than that, because Brave is shipping new features every single month with a mission to make Web3 easier to navigate for its over 55 million users. Wallet extensions are a thing of the past. So get started with Brave's Web3 Ready browser today and experience a decentralized web seamlessly without all the clutter. You can download the browser at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. Sequence is the all-in-one developer platform you need to build Web3 games and applications. For your users, Sequence is a smart wallet and it's the easiest, most intuitive onboarding your users will ever experience and comes with all the features users need to feel empowered in the Web3 world. Multi-chain support, NFT display, and users can buy SFTs, NFTs, and crypto directly with a credit or debit card. For developers, Sequence is the plug and play platform for Web3 games and apps. Their APIs let you bring NFTs, SFTs, and tokens tokens into your game or application, and the Sequence Relayer enables gasless transactions for your users. Sequence already powers some of the best Web3 games like Skyweaver, NFT projects like Cool Cats, and marketplaces like NiftySwap. And Sequence is compatible with all the EVM chains, including Ethereum, Polygon, Binance Smart Chain, Arbitrum, Optimism, and Avalanche. So go to sequence.xyz slash bankless to start building or speak with the Sequence team today. The reality today is that five corporations control the entire world of social media. They own our names, they restrict our content, they monitor our every move. And their time is up, thanks to our sponsor, Deso. Deso is a layer one blockchain built from the ground up to decentralize and scale social networks. With Deso, you can own your own identity, content, and social graph, and take it with you across hundreds of applications already built on the censorship resistant Deso blockchain. Deso's storage advantages make it finally possible to build infinite state applications applications that can efficiently store and index large amounts of content and data fully on-chain. Deso also offers multiple crypto-native monetization primitives for developers and creators, including social NFTs, social DAOs, social tokens, and social tipping. So in order to experience the social layer of Web3, go to Deso.com and claim your username. That's D-E-S-O dot com. Bankless Nation, Vitalik Buterin is on the podcast today. Vitalik is your friendly neighborhood Ethereum developer. He's an alfalfa male who thinks we should rename gas to mana. I didn't know that, actually. <laughs> Vitalik, welcome back to Bankless. How are you doing? Thank you so much, guys. It's great to be here. Uh, Vitalik, 2022 has been an absolutely crazy year. Um, Disastrous. Yeah. Say. And like the industry is hurting, the community's feeling a lot of pain. I just, maybe just to kick this thing off, can you just give your thoughts and reflections on this? Like, was this unexpected? Um, what's your assessment of, of the crypto community after this crazy year we've had? Mm, um, so 2022 has been, uh, I think, a complicated year, right? I think uh, a lot of people are remembering the year for all of the yeah, terrible stuff that's uh, happened and uh, within the crypto space for all, all of the yeah, multi-billion dollar blowups. But I think it's uh, also important to remember all of the various positives that the yeah, crypto space has seen, right? Um, so the merge, I think, is uh, the most recent one, but the big one, right? This is something that uh, the Ethereum has been uh, waiting for pretty much since its inception, right? And it's been uh, delayed and complexified and turned out to be more complex than we thought. And uh, lots of things have happened, but you know, now finally, um, as of uh, September 15th, I think it was uh, 0645 uh, UTC, um, you know, we uh, actually have a proof of stake chain, right? And, uh, you know, doesn't it just like feel good to be able to say like, no, no, not Ethereum is going to reduce its energy consumption by 99.9%, but Ethereum has reduced its energy consumption by 99.9%, right? Like uh, we're literally talking about going from a level of electricity consumption similar to the entire country of Austria to a level of uh, electricity consumption similar to the entire country of, uh, I don't know, maybe San Marino, maybe Vatican, like one of those. 
right? Uh, so you know, huge success also from the uh, just protocol security point of view, um, even a huge success from the usability point of view, right? So like a lot of people don't realize this, but the merge was actually a uh, transaction inclusion time decrease, right? And this happened for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is actually the easier one to understand, which is that you know, blocks have thousands of attestations uh, that are coming on top of them. And so you have thousands of confirmations happening in parallel. And what that basically means is that a few seconds after one single block comes, you have the equivalent of what would in proof of work lanes be considered hundreds of confirmations, right? Like if you go to etherscan.io slash blocks underscore forked, right? And the most recent forked block was six days ago. In the proof of work era, there would be multiple of these every hour, right? So that's the first reason. The second reason is that because uh, block times now are, instead of being this like very random Poisson distribution thing where, uh, you know, sometimes you have a block every yeah, two seconds, sometimes you have a block only after a minute. Here we have a block in a nice regular pattern of 12 seconds. And what this means is that on average, you only have to wait six seconds for a yeah, transaction to get included, right? Now, this all sounds theoretical, but just from my own very practical experience, like my experience using Ethereum has just improved massively. It's like, you know, night and day compared to, let's say, yeah, you know, July 2020 before um, all of this stuff and before EIP 1559 happens, right? Like these days when I send a transaction, I click send, I wait a couple of seconds and then I see, oh, that transaction got included into one block and it already has one confirmation. Like. It's not quite competitive with, um, you know, Web2, oh my God, let's pay $35 million so the latency is 184 milliseconds instead of 212 milliseconds as standards, but it's like already good enough to be competitive with, say, credit card point of sale systems, right? And that's something that I think is uh, really important to appreciate. Like there's been just this massive increase in the usability of the base Ethereum chain that's happened pretty much under our noses. And uh, EIP-1559 was the first half of this, the merge was the second half of this. And you know, the third half of this, of course, is gonna be rollups that have uh, pre-confirmations, which is coming next year. And uh, later on, we'll talk about how I think uh, 2023 is going to be the year of uh, rollups actually yeah, hitting stage one of trustlessness, which will make a, mean that Ethereum actually finally is in its scalable era, right? But before that, so the merge happened and the, uh, Merge was amazing. Um, 2022 was also the year of ZK EVMs, right? So five years ago, the zeitgeist basically was uh, that, oh, there is this fancy thing called ZK Snark technology, and like maybe theoretically it could make abstract proofs and you can turn things into polynomials and like put stuff on top of stuff and maybe eventually verify a, an Ethereum block, but like, come on, it's so high overhead that's gonna take like literally four weeks to make a proof and uh, f four years to actually audit uh, the code to do any of that, right? Um, but fast forward to 2022, and we have multiple ZK EVM implementations that are all promising some kind of mainnet launch next year. Like, this is amazing, right? Like, ZK EVMs have just gone from being a non existent pipe dream to being the, I think, clear and manifest uh, long term and uh, possibly even medium term uh, future of scaling Ethereum, right? So that's number two. Um, then, you know, on the adoption front, right, uh, sign in with Ethereum has seen massive, uh, you know, gains in adoption. Um, Ethereum, I think, was in a great position to take advantage of uh, people's desire to explore the ver like various uh, alternative Twitters, alternative social media platforms, right? So, uh, Farcaster sign into that with an Ethereum account, Lens sign into that with an Ethereum account, and I've used um, you know Farcaster and uh, Lens, and um, you know, they're actually great. Um, Fast forwarding to earlier in the year, um, I I feel like you know it, a lot of crypto people have forgotten about this, but it's still super important to remember the yeah, invasion of Ukraine in February, right? Which is uh, definitely an uh, extremely tragic event overall. But the part of it that is, uh, I think, not, uh, quite happy is um, obviously that they've succeeded uh, in uh, defending themselves far beyond most people's expectations. But I think uh, you know cryptocurrency payments 
actually worked for them when uh, when nothing else worked. And uh, you know they've actually yeah, starting from that very first tweet that uh, the country's official Twitter account uh, you know made on the the morning or the day after the yeah, invasion. You know cryptocurrency actually yeah, has been a lifeline for the country, a lifeline for a lot of civilians and the people, right? And and you know th that's just like one example. And then you know you have all these various small examples like. Uh, you know, continuing adoption happening in places like Latin America, for example. Um, you know, I came to Argentina last year, I came to Argentina this year, and uh, the level of sophistication has improved uh, by uh, a lot, right? And, uh, you know, we've been, one of the things I saw, for example, is uh, when I uh, visited uh, just uh, recently, there was a yeah, group, I forgot their name, I think it was called either DeFi Latam or something uh, vaguely uh, called like this, right? But this was a yeah, just a really lovely person from Venezuela. And he was basically saying like, hey, you know, the FTX uh, situation is, um, mm -hmm. you know, helps me realize that DeFi actually is important. And like, I want to help uh, Latin Americans, um, you know, who need crypto actually yeah, interact with crypto in ways that are decentralized and that uh, involve self custody. And um, you know, this uh, person actually knew a huge amount about uh, you know layer two protocols, a huge amount about uh, you know different forms of self custody and all of these things. Um, so all of those things are you know continuing to move forward. Um, cryptocurrency got used for is continuing to get used for philanthropy a lot. Um, so. Uh, the last year was the year of um, you know crypto relief India getting its money, but um, you know this year crypto relief India continued spending some of its money. Um, also, Balvi, it's this uh, group that like I helped uh, spin up that used some of the money to uh, put money into these more, it's more experimental but potentially much more high payoff um, options um, in terms of uh, protecting people now and in the future against viruses and that's funded amazing stuff like um, you know uv lamps uh, open source vaccine projects and uh, a whole bunch of things and like cryptocurrency as a uh, international payment instrument for philanthropy has just been huge there right so I think it's important to just remember uh, 2022, both uh, not just for the uh, massive failures, but also for all the uh, amazing technological and adoption backdrops that we've had. And uh, I think even the first inklings of cryptocurrency and uh, blockchain spaces ability to like, actually have very significant positive impacts on the world. Um, but you know, that's the year. So. Well, Vitalik, thank you so much for coming into this with your your optimist hat on and just reminding us that sometimes the bad definitely drowns out the good. Uh, as someone who's been through multiple market cycles, like every single market cycle has the bad year, right? The down year, right? 2018 was, was my first one. There was one prior to that. Is 2022 unusual in any respects or is this kind of par for the course of like, yeah, this is this is what happens at the the the, la the latter half of a bull market. We have a lot, a lot of bad stuff. But meanwhile, there is relentless adoption regardless, uh, no matter what year it is. Uh, is 2022 unusual for you uh, in, in contrast to other uh, years of crypto? I'm trying to compare 2022 against the uh, kind of early to mid bear market periods of the previous cycles, right? Um, actually, yeah, if you want to show people visuals, one great visual to show right now is uh, the Bitcoin price from uh, 2011 to now. Bitcoin, just because Ethereum, unfortunately, didn't exist in 2011. Um, but if you look at that, right, you know, you see kind of the great cycles, right? And, uh, you know, you have 2011 um, and then the really big one at the end of 2013, and then the even bigger one in 2017, and then the, yeah, and a super big one in uh, 2021, right? And see, the, the the very first one at the left, it's like so low that we don't even notice it, right? Um, like, like if you just click, if you just click the log button, wow. And so the 2015, right? So if you go down that flat part after the first uh, peak, that's when Ethereum launched, right? So, then 2018, uh, that's uh, the uh, flat and the kind of cup and handle after the second uh, bull market. That's when Uniswap was uh, created and started existing for the first time. Now let's look at the flat and uh, slightly decreasing line after the third bubble. Um, that's when the merge happened 
and we had multiple ZK EVMs, and we're starting to see serious layer two adoption. Uh, so the Asia uh, post uh, peak periods are always uh, periods in, in which there actually are some pretty significant uh, technological uh, progress uh, that is uh, happening. They are periods uh, where, I mean, Often it's easier for people to get back to work because the yeah, numbers aren't giving them dopamine hits every six hours anymore. And um, there are mm -hmm. periods where like, a lot of uh, real work uh, gets done and even periods where the good gets separated from the bad, right? Uh, so one of the other reasons I uh, yeah, wanted to make that analogy is that if you go back to 2014, right? The, yeah, the FTX of 2014, kind of, uh, Mount Gox. I actually kind of don't want to even call Mount Gox the FTX of 2014 because I just feel like the way like Mark Rappelis did a whole did a bunch of horrible stuff, but I actually feel like the way that he has handled himself post blow up has actually been kind of honorable. Like you know he hasn't tried to give himself a yeah, Suju style uh, redemption arc or um, you know in like kind of give himself attention on Twitter. He just kind of you know what quiet for a while, just diligently worked on helping people get their money back and. Uh, you know, working on uh, on on Gox and other and, and other things, right? Like that's uh, it's like our villains are getting lower quality now, right? It's uh, you know, <laughs> like Mark, I think, yeah, you know, he is actually yeah, like improved in ways that like I just unfortunately, um, you know, don't expect uh, people like uh, Sue like Sue and Kyle to improve even a decade from now. Um, but you know, very much hope I'm wrong, though. I yeah, think I'm you know, I, I, I'm always happy when uh, people positively outperform my expectations, uh, right? But the Mt. Gox uh, blow up in 2014, it did feel like an existential crisis for the crypto space. It felt like a huge crisis for Bitcoin. It felt like a huge crisis for legitimacy. It was an invitation for regulators to swarm around the space. And it uh, mm, you know, did have a lot of bad consequences in all kinds of places, and it made a huge number of people very unhappy. Uh, 2022, uh, you know, a lot of uh, very similar things are happening, except you know now we have... I think a much more interconnected uh, crypto space and we have a lot more sophistication. And so you know, on the other hand, a lot more fragility and uh, contagion happening, right? Though I think it's, it's important to remember that like in 2014, there was fragility and contagion too, right? Because Mt. Gox, when it collapsed, it was both the thing causing the crypto price to, prices to crash and also the uh, thing that people were used to as being the place where prices moved up and down. And so the market will have to like, basically crash and change where it, uh, where its numbers were coming from at the same time, right? And here, you know, this year we had the double whammy of, uh, you know, obviously first uh, Luna uh, com coming back down to Earth and uh, Terra going back to down to somewhere much, much lower than Earth. Um, and, um, you know, six months later, obviously, yeah, FTX blowing up. And then a month after that, I think, um, BlockFi is like in, a, in bankruptcy or something like that now, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely echoes of a yeah, similar situation. But at the same time, like, I don't want to all be rosy about it because I think uh, the other thing that's important to remember now that I think will make 2022 harder to recover from than 2014 is that I think a community having like this a very high variance and like both high excitement and high turnoff approach to uh, existing is uh, something that's a very good strategy when you're trying to increase adoption from 0.1% to 10%, but it's a terrible strategy when you're trying to increase adoption from 10% to 70%, right? I think this is a, a criticism I would have made of uh, Bitcoin maximalism uh, uh, sometime uh, uh, ago too, right? That uh, if you're just a small community, then if you say uh, you know, incredibly over the top things about how the uh, U.S. government is the primary source of all evil in the world, and money printing is the reason why uh, you know we have some kind of military status uh, dystopia instead of uh, you know Switzerland-like happy land for everyone, um, then it's uh, 
you know, you're going to turn off a lot of people who clearly kind of see through those um, attitudes and realize that there's a lot more complicated stuff going on in the world. But at the same time, there is going to be some portion of the population that like really believes in the thing you believe or is really receptive to the thing you believe. And they're attracted to the passion with which you say it. And so they're going to, you know, wants to uh, come along with you. And, uh, you know, being in this kind of siege mentality uh, where they are one of the few brave soldiers uh, pushing forward the future, even if, um, you know, huge uh, portions of the mainstream world and the Paul Krugmans and uh, uh, the Elizabeth Warrens and all of those characters are, um, you know, rabidly against them. Like, there is a group of people to whom that, like, being in that position of the siege narrative really appeals to them, right? But that's how you get from 0.1% to 10%. And crypto is no longer in the stage of getting from 0.1% to 10%. Um, I think... Uh, there have been adoption charts and like estimates that people have attempted to make. And in some countries, ownership of cryptocurrency is like literally at the 10% of the population level. So now it like the space is at the level of trying to get from 10% to 70%. And that requires different strategies. And strategy is where, you know, this really crazy stuff that keeps losing people $5 billion keeps happening are like the exact opposite of uh, what the space wants and needs to do. Right. So. I, yeah, you know, I, I wanted to give the message of optimism, but also give this kind of important message that there is uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. And, uh, you know, the status quo, even if it's a status quo that's like seri kind of secretly exciting and fun for a lot of us, like that's, uh, you know, not the sort of thing that we want crypto to continue to be four years from now if we yeah, actually wanted to succeed. Is it is it possible we just get stuck in that niche of that zero to 10%? We never, I mean, I know it's possible, but do you think that's a... And it, like a, a, a high probability outcome? It's a good question. Um, back in, I think, uh, 2011 or 12, one of the earliest articles that I wrote for Bitcoin Weekly, uh, it was called something like uh, Bitcoin, Esperanto, Linux, or the Internet. Right, basically comparing Bitcoin to uh, like three different things that started off as being these uh, very idealistic movements to replace the existing system with a uh, totally different and much better system, right? Uh, so Esperanto was this uh, constructed language um, invented by uh, Ludwig Zamenhof in the late 19th century. The goal basically being to create a language which is easier to learn because it has much uh, simpler and more regular spelling and grammar. Um, and uh, it's uh, the theory was that uh, you know, everyone would learn Esperanto in addition to their national language and everyone could speak Esperanto with each other and that would be the path to world peace, right? Um, and Esperanto ended up not really succeeding, right? It's this uh, fairly niche interest community at this point. And, you know, there are speakers, but it's like enthusiasts that are just... Uh, you know, in it as a hobby, like even more, much more than a, a yeah, pragmatic a, a communication tool or like an actual attempt to uh, make world peace at this point, right? And which is like sad. I mean, I personally love, uh, to, like, I never learned Esperanto super deeply, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a really cool language. I think the world probably would have been better if it got much more what, adopted. What's but... cool about it, by the way, just to nerd out for just a second, is it a combo of kind of like, is it some sort of Latin derivative? Or this is really based yeah. from scratch. They 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 built a new language right. from the ground up, so it's well, different. It's uh, Esperanto is interesting. So like I mean, I, I have this like combination of very uh, uh, like positive and critical views of it. Um, I think uh, the the critical view is basically that it's a language that strove to be universal, but actually ended up being like very European specific. So like uh, for. Example, the way that you make a plural in Esperanto is you add a J, and a J is pronounced Y, right? So kind of like how in uh, Eastern European languages or or, um, or in German, uh, right? Uh, so I mean, if you want to say some, if you want to, uh, I think what, like, try and think of like good, ex good examples for nouns in Esperanto. This is like, I think homo is, a per is like a person and homoi is people. Um, let me just uh, ch uh, check that quickly. Um, but, and then you have like the end, which is an, which is the accusative case, right? The accusative case is like the same, like, you know how in English you like, 
if you're doing something, you say I am doing something. If someone's doing something to you, you say someone's doing something to me. So I is the nominative and me is the accusative. So uh, a lot of European languages have that for nouns and as well as pronouns. And uh, Esperanto has that for nouns as well. Um, so it has a lot of these very European specific features. But at the same time, the good is that it is extremely regular. Um, so it uh, even... Um, things like so like english for example right like you have words like who what where when why um and then you have like well that because therefore at that time right and so or if you want like the negative then you have no one never for no reason right and like you have this kind of two by two table that's uh, really complicated in esperanto it's like a really yeah, it's a, an incredibly clean system where like i think it's the like the first half of the word is like do you mean which do you mean uh, do you mean that do you mean no one and then the second half of the word is like are you referring to a person or are you referring to a time or are you referring to a place um so it's got um, a lot of regularity in the grammar. It's got a lot of uh, regularity in the spelling, right? So English has a lot of these, uh, you know, really dumb spelling rules, and you have to memorize, uh, you know, memorize uh, spellings of a lot of words really thoroughly, um, in including the word thoroughly, which like makes uh, totally no sense. Like, but but know, I guess that's the point, but, right? Even if you design right. the most perfect language right. from a technical perspective, uh -huh. that's not how right. you actually get adoption for a exactly. language, right? So there's yes. like the theoretical perfection. Right, so this is this is the analogy, right? It's uh, you know it has all these beautiful technical properties, but the yeah, adoption roadmap basically went nowhere, right? And instead, like English had too much of a network effect, and uh, you know especially post World War II, where pretty much every major country except for the uh, United States uh, got turned into ruins. Um, you know that I think uh, set. English on a path uh, to dominance, and uh, I, I don't really think anything else is in a position to challenge it now, right? So that's Esperanto. Now, Linux is an interesting middle case, right? So Linux is interesting because it's kind of succeeded and it kind of has not succeeded, right? So Linux is this um, open source operating system, so it's uh, an alternative to things like Mac and Windows. So I'm speaking right now through a uh, computer that is running a Linux uh, distribution. But Linux has had this uh, interesting mixture of success and failure. So Linux on the desktop is mostly a failure. So it is a uh, product that is continuing to be developed, and it is very usable, and I use it, and I think it's great. But it just doesn't quite appeal to the majority of people, right? But on the other hand, Linux has become this really important so like backend thing. So Android, for example, which a lot of phones use, runs on the Linux kernel. A huge portion of all the servers run on Linux. Um, a huge portion of developers, like pe including people who write the Ethereum code base, that not all, but it's a very significant portion. Their computer, they run Linux on their computers because Linux is just very developer friendly, right? Uh, so there's uh, a lot of. Uh, Play, like specific communities and specific applications in which Linux is very entrenched. And then there's this permanent dream of uh, Linux uh, as an open source operating system becoming this thing that really takes over for everyone, but that just ends up never quite succeeding, right? And then the third is the internet, and uh, the internet is just obviously, uh, you know, completely taken over everything, right? And so my question back in 2011 is, uh, is Bitcoin going to look more like Esperanto, more like Linux, or more like the internet? And I kind of was willing to accept all three possibilities as being likely, and I wasn't sure yet. I think today cryptocurrency is way past being Esperanto, right? Uh, but uh, it does, the question is like, how Linuxy is it going to be, or how internet-y is it going to be? And I don't know. I mean, it's very possible that it's going to be in the middle, right? So like, it's very possible that, well, just one example, in developed countries, it's going to be like Linux on the desktop, but in the yeah, developing world, it's going to become like uh, ubiquitous. It's very pos possible that, it, that in both worlds, it's uh, going to be something that's uh, organized or concentrated around a few particular industries that where like, say, yeah, reversibility of credit card transactions and other things just like totally makes no sense that cryptocurrency is the best thing that works. It might just be something that people have as a store of value without really using day to day. And when a big crisis comes, it just becomes uh, suddenly really important for people and people appreciate it. Right? Or it's possible that, um, you know, the next uh, 
basically all of the uh, yeah, infrastructure of the next wave of technology is going to be yeah, built around Linux. Uh, or sorry, built around uh, cryptocurrency, right? Hopefully cryptocurrency and Linux. That would be more the Web3, that last piece of like, exactly. the, the Web3 meme. Yeah, so which one is it going to be? I don't know. And uh, I mean, I am a definite optimist on this. I think uh, which one it's going to turn out to be uh, depends crucially on how hard we try and uh, mm. what we try to do. Interesting. So you actually think that we have uh, a lot of agency over the outcome of whether or not a crypto actually replaces the internet or just provides a few very useful applications? I think absolutely. Um, I think uh, it's actually really important for like good people in the yeah, Ethereum space to recognize that they have agency and exercise it, because I think if good people act passive, then the things that take over just are going to be, um, you know, the yeah, dr the drama queens of the world, right? And like I think we as people trying to do build actually meaningful things, you know, have a responsibility to work hard to drown out the drama queens and. Uh, that's a challenge, and, and I think sometimes oh. the way you can do worse, sometimes we do better. But you know, we got to try. That is a challenge, Vitalik. But that, like, I I'm almost tempted to to um turn this into like give us some personal advice here. Like, how do we do that? All right. So I I'm leaving partially 2022 again, feeling embarrassed that I'm in crypto. Oh, you have a, a crypto podcast at, at your next. How's like, that going for you? How's that bro? going for you? And, you know, mainstream people outside, sort of the, the normies, the people who are in the 90%, not the, the, the 10%, uh, they're looking at this industry and being like, what? Are, is this just run by a bunch of kind of clowns and scammers? Like, where are the adults? Are they, I thought you guys, you preach crypto values and then I see all of this. And so um, I'm feeling a little down at the end of, of 2022, but also reflective in, in terms of like, what could we have done better? What lessons could we learn? Do we need to like, um, I mean, I know we've talked before about like how you call out, you know, scammers and kind of the social layer and you can, you can veer too far to one extreme or another, but, uh, yeah. What are you, what are your thoughts advice for us in general? And then maybe we can, we talk about like, uh, lessons for the entire community. So just to kind of start slowly moving into the yeah, blog post we wanted to talk about a bit, uh, the, yeah, we'll start with uh, the first eight words of it, right? So the title, um, I intentionally said what in the Ethereum application ecosystem excites me instead of what in the crypto space excites me. This is, uh, in experiments I've been uh, trying, right? Basically, yeah, like using the word crypto less and uh, using the word Ethereum more, uh, and this is like a subtle thing. I mean, it's still an early stage experiment, so I'm not entirely yeah, you know, sure what all like what all of the consequences of like, emphasizing Ethereum in particular much more would be. But like the theory here, like it, it. So first of all, it's not maximalist, right? So it's not saying like you know, focus on Ethereum to the exclusion of everything else. It's more saying we are not going to implicitly ally with you just because you are a cryptocurrency by default, right? The yeah, problem with the crypto space is that the crypto space is an ungovernable commons that has a no barrier to entry, right? So if you remember, you know, the basics of, uh, you know, Eleanor Ostrom's theory of the commons and what commons is create tragedies of the commons and what commons is can be governed. One of the basic ingredients for a commons to be governed is gatekeeping, right? Like you have to actually be able to, um, you know, say, you know, this is us and this is not us and uh, actually be able to like, have some level of enforcement or filtering in the thing that is us. With, with the crypto space, like the only qualification to be able to call yourself part of the crypto space and not have people complain is to just like somehow use cryptography and to have some kind of chained data structure somewhere. Like those are literally the qualifications. Like. You don't even need decentralization, right? Like I forget, has IOTA even gotten rid of their coordinator yet? I forget now. No, right? the answer is no. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, like XRP, right? Like, you know, they're like still completely centralized. And, uh, but, uh, you know, at the same time, they are, you know, on coin market cap and, uh, you know, still, I think, uh, haven't apologized for writing documents into the, yeah, uh, to the U.S. government, uh, basically saying that they should be favored over Bitcoin and Ethereum because Bitcoin and Ethereum are China-controlled. 
And so, like, so Vitaly, but, when, you, when you have a permissionless commons, you're saying right. the role of gatekeeper is essential, and that role is essentially a kind of a social layer type role. Let right. me let me throw the criticism at you that you might expect to see. You probably won't expect to hear that now, but like earlier this year, you would have would have expected to hear that if you talk about the Ethereum ecosystem. Well, that makes you an Ethereum maximalist, okay? And crypto is much broader than Ethereum, and we live in a multi-chain world here. And so decentral- and you're just pumping your bags. And you're just pumping your bags and decentralized values can exist outside of Ethereum or the so-called crypto values can exist. So stop limiting yourselves to Ethereum. Th- that was kind of the ju- jujitsu move some some pulled whenever you start trying to like redefine the boundaries and start to do a little bit of gatekeeping. Okay, so this is a good point. So here is my um, analogy. Uh, so suppose um, that you have an American politician uh, who goes on CNN And uh, he says, um, you know, here is a package of policies. Uh, Here are some things that I want to deregulate. Here are some things that I want to subsidize. Um, And uh, here are some uh, things that that I want to encourage. And uh, the combination of these ideas is needed to reinvigorate American prosperity into the 21st century. If you hear someone saying this from the perspective of a non-American, does that sound America maximalist? No, <laughs> well, right. yeah, so, no, it doesn't. Right, um, like it does. It does get a little bit complicated, right? Because like, like there is definitely a, a like I think a real effect where there's like some Americans that sort of act like the non-America world doesn't exist. But I think like just uh, you know the the sentence that I just said, like you know, it is totally innocuous, right? Um, and I think, so, well, the difference though is that uh, being people are frequently born into America, and then that's just like not actually their choice. Whereas when you right. come into the crypto space, you're kind of like a blank slate, and you get to choose your chain or tribe that you mm-hmm. align with. So I think that's mm-hmm. the main biggest difference there. That is true. Um, though I think uh, I don't know. I feel like the whole like. I've even seen immigrants to America, uh, like, but be on both sides of the, uh, you know, we love American prosperity discourse. Um, but I think, uh, you know, even still, like, I'm sometimes, like, oh, like the point that I want to make about Ethereum, right, is that I think that there should be a way to talk about Ethereum that doesn't uh, implicitly, um, you know, lend credence uh, to the, uh, you know, the Lunas and the XRPs and the IOTAs and the Bitcoin Satoshi's visions of the world, but that still does leave room for uh, kind of va- valuing the, the good and the yeah, honorable things that are happening in other ecosystems. Right. So, uh, like, I'm happy to say that, you know, I think the Cosmos ecosystem, for example, I, yeah, you know, I deeply respect it because it is uh, one of the few that's actually trying a very like, different region of uh, design space. And, uh, you know, they have this vision of, uh, you know, a, a larger number of blockchains. Each of those blockchains has a small number of validators. They use these uh, protocols to talk to each other. And, and they uh, give up on shared security, but they ha- and give up on tight coupling, but they have modularity. And, um, you know, here's their arguments for why this might be a good idea. And like, I, yeah, I really respect the fact that, you know, they have a technical vision. They push a technical vision first. They, in my view, have not been pump and dumpy. Uh, you know, they yeah, have not done any, they, they have not bought any stadi- stadiums. They, yeah, you know, have not uh, put the, the face of their founder up on uh, cylinders all over San Francisco. Um, so, like, that's something I respect. Um, you know, the Zcash ecosystem, I think I've talked about about them consider- consistently many times. Um, you know, Bitcoin, I, uh, I value the uh, self-custody uh, ethos and the uh, decentralization ethos, and I think that's one that we have a lot to learn from, right? So... The thing that I'm getting at is that I think there should be a way to like both talk about Ethereum and even talk about Ethereum, like non-Ethereum projects that we still think are contributing to good, um, but in a way where like we're not extending alliance to everyone by default. And so mm-hmm. this is a... Uh, like, this is one of the things that I'm in the process of thinking through, right? Like, basically, yeah, what exactly what is the, the right formula for doing that? As, uh, like, if you think about things from that perspective, right? Like, in 2022, what's the worst thing that happened in Ethereum land? 
I would say probably like, see, this also depends on how you define Ethereum land because okay. NFTs, board apes, for mm -hmm. example, right? So, some people mm -hmm. would point to that and say, look, celebrity endorsements, kind of pump and dump NFT. Where's the NFT? Well, that was an ERC 721 on what? On Ethereum. So is Ethereum ecosystem? Question mark. I don't know. Uh, maybe something like that I would point to. I think if Bored Apes are the worst thing that happened in Ethereum in 2022, that's doing okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that too. Yeah, okay. Um, what's, what's the worst thing that happened in Cosmos in 2022? I don't... Th oh, oh, except for Terra. Do you, I mean, I do you consider Terra, Terra and Luna Cosmos? Yes, yes, you do. That do is you? true. That is a... Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's why these boundaries are so difficult. Right, it's a good point, right? See, the, the, this is why I'm kind of intentionally hedging this as a yeah, kind right. of thought in progress, right? Because I think, like, ultimately, there definitely is a trade-off between being permissionless in the good sense and being permissionless in the sense of, like, letting literally anyone who wants to come in and borrow your social credibility, which is the type yeah. of permissionlessness that we don't want. And there's probably some kind of balance to draw between those. Um, yeah. Well, so that, that's actually an, an interesting case to unpack because like, I, I feel like no, no one blames Cosmos, the ecosystem at all for the Terra collapse by the nature of the app chain model. Everything's kind of like compartmentalized, right? And so while there is uh, composability risks as in the value of UST that got spread across the chains and Cosmos all went to zero, no one really blames Cosmos as a whole for that by the nature of how app chains come together. Uh, perhaps one of the worst things to answer to after I've thought about the question, what's the worst thing that happened in the Ethereum ecosystem? I'm pretty sure the Wonderland drama, uh, which was kind of uh, Ethereum's mm -hmm. microcosm of Terra. It was an algorithmic mm -hmm. stablecoin. Stablecoin went to zero. Uh, turns out zero. Xifu was the ex Quadringa uh, perpetual like fraudster scammer person. Uh, that did happen on Ethereum in Ethereum DeFi, mm -hmm. uh, and right. so like that that was on our chain. That was inside of our borders. This is true, but I guess the saving grace is like the Ethereum influencer elite never treated Daniel Sesta with, with the slightest dose of respect, right? Yeah, yeah, he, uh, um, we, I, I fought with him for sure. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure even like the Cosmos um, influencer elite, I, uh, yeah. Did they ever like treat Terra with that much deep respect? I actually I don't, don't think know. so. No, I don't remember any instance of this. Right. Yeah. So Vitalik, um, we want uh, one of the main reasons to bring you on the show today is because of a recent fantastic blog post. Uh, and I want to connect these these conversations that we've had to this blog post uh, first with this uh, this first question. Um, one of the things that I've been personally thinking about uh, is, and as a result of your blog post, is um, one of the main uh, euphoric statements that like I echoed and many people in, in crypto in 2021 echoed is like, there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of DAOs. There will be so many DeFi apps, NFTs and NFT projects for absolutely everyone. Uh, and then, and that was like, okay, this is web three is replacing the internet. We have this internet thing and where it's going to completely be replaced by web three. So earlier we were having this conversation. It was like, all right, is crypto Esperanto Linux or the internet? And you're like, well, definitely not Esperanto. Um, hopefully more than Linux, um, perhaps as big as the internet, but TBD. And then when I was reading uh, some of the components of your of your blog post, which is like you said, titled uh, "What What Applications in Ethereum That I Believe In." Um, I was thinking like, oh, maybe actually in the DeFi landscape, there's only a handful of very strong, very useful DeFi applications, things like uh, exchange DEXs like Uniswap and SushiSwap, things like borrowing and lending services like Aave. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that, a few more, but not too much more after that. And then also there's a conversation on DAOs. Uh, are there, are there going to be a Cambrian explosion of DAOs where me and my group chat form a DAO and so does like every other group chat in the world form a DAO? We have all these bajillion DAOs out there, DAOs for every single stated purpose that exists. Or is decentralization much more surgically applied to a few more use cases? Uh, and so these are some of the lessons that I, I'm thinking of. And this is going to think, I think, be a, an overarching theme for the rest of this podcast. But before we dive into specifically your uh, article, I just want to, to ask you as a whole, what lessons do you think we learned uh, as an industry in 2022 now that we are in December looking backwards? Like what, what lessons did you personally learn, Vitalik? And what lessons do you think we should all uh, make explicit here on this podcast so that we can know to not do them again in 2023 and beyond. 
Yeah, I think the big takeaway is that I think the crypto space is at its most honorable only insofar as it actually takes its own core principles seriously. Um, so, like, I mean, well, what those core principles are should be pretty obvious, right? It's, uh, you know, decentralization, openness, self custody, being transparent with people, right? And those are all values that FTX did the exact opposite of uh, pretty much uh, since the beginning, right? And uh, those are, I would say, even even values that Terra violated to some extent. I mean, I think Terra is a more complicated case because Terra was uh, a hybrid of a uh, mechanism that was open and transparent, but it was just bad with a mechanism that well, the, yeah, the, the rescue fund, which was uh, com completely opaque. Um, but... That was uh, FTX, I think, uh, definitely, you know, the exact opposite of uh, openness and uh, trustlessness. Um, a lot of the uh, applications that uh, grew a lot, but then ended up completely failing, they uh, probably tried too hard to kind of integrate with the mainstream and doing that by compromising toward the mainstream ways of doing things. And eventually it just... Uh, get to the point where you realize there's just no point in having a blockchain left, right? Uh, so my, one of the examples of this might be like the uh, supply chain blockchain trial. I think it was uh, ASX or one of those groups that uh, did it and it just shut down recently, right? There's just a lot of these enterprise blockchain projects that have quietly shut down over the last couple of years. Um, and even the the, the blockchain project uh, enterprise projects that were not shutting down, they generally went into the direction of, hey, how about we're going to be more public chain now, right? And that, like that's a trend that I feel like we've been talking about for a few years already. Um, so what kinds of things have succeeded, right? So Uniswap has succeeded, Rai has succeeded, um, Dai, um, you know, in the middle of a very complicated governance discussion, wish it success. Uh, you know, the Ethereum base layer succeeded, ENS succeeded, right? So, um, smart contract wallets rising, um, account abstraction rising, um, privacy technology. I think it's, uh, obviously uh, hit, hit a yeah, speed bump with, uh, the, the various legal issues, but that's, uh, so, I think something that's, that is going to continue. It is going to pick up again, um, next year and, um, over the next couple of years. So there's just a lot of different uh, th things that like actually are blockchain-y and open and, de and uh, decentralized and trusted that basically survived the whole situation completely unscathed, right? And it's the centralized stuff where everyone is wondering, like, you know, hey, am I ever going to get my money back, right? And this, like, there's actually different ways of having this perspective, right? So, like... The more crypto negative way of having this perspective would be to say that like, oh, crypto was more honorable when it, it understood that it was like a yeah, very niche gray market thing, kind of like the Pirate Bay, and it just tried to be that. Um, but then the speculators came in and tried to turn it into something much, much bigger than uh, what it was supposed to be. And uh, that's where all of, all of the biggest, biggest harms are coming from, right? So like that's a view that you definitely hear from a certain tribe of uh, like more crypto negative people, but in some ways that's basically saying the same thing, right? So you know whether you believe the more crypto positive kind of like sl slant on that or the more crypto negative slant on that, like the core idea that the parts of the crypto space that are honorable are are the parts of the crypto space that actually try to stay true to its values, I think is uh, something that there is a very broad agreement on. And uh, that's the thing that uh, you know, I want to double down on. Yeah, ag agreed. Um, and um, yeah, the, the things that did stay true to those decentralization values are still left standing at the end of 2022. So let, let's talk about this because you wrote this post, uh, what in the Ethereum application ecosystem excites me? And you broke it into kind of five different uh, categories, money, DeFi, identity, DAOs, and hybrid applications. And I, I know you picked these five for a reason. So let, let's talk about each. And it's it's actually interesting because that, that you put uh, money as the first, because um, I think maybe it was um, some, a lot of what you were saying, I think the last time you came into the Bankless podcast or maybe a couple times ago, Vitalik was like, hey, money is one use case and that's cool, but I'd love to expand outside of money. 
And yet money is the very first use case. So could you talk about this? Is this a proven thing? What do you see in the, in the, in the money use case that's actually uh, exciting in, in uh, Ethereum? No, you make a good point. So like, I think there has been this uh, contradiction in the Ethereum space almost since the beginning between a uh, vibe that wants to tr try to be more than just money um, in part because it wants to try to be more than just Bitcoin um, versus, um, you know, the reality that's just obvious uh, from the outside of the space, which is that uh, cryptocurrency as currency just is far more proven than um, all of the more speculative stuff. I uh, ac actually think, though, that the two perspectives are more compatible than it might seem. And the reason why they're more compatible than it might seem is uh, because the... Uh, application category that I spent the least time on in uh, this post is DeFi, right? Like I think uh, the vibe that uh, I was uh, reacting to when, for example, I made that presentation in uh, Paris uh, about uh, a year and a half ago uh, was uh, one where there was uh, not too much attention on money, a huge amount of uh, attention on all kinds of uh, incredibly complicated DeFi things, and then a tiny amount of attention on you know, non-money and identity and social stuff, right? And my view on DeFi that uh, we'll get into in this uh, post is basically that I think uh, simple DeFi good, complicated DeFi bad, right? Like by far the most important applications in the DeFi space in terms of actually being able to provide value to people are just incredibly simple stuff like, for example, stable coins, right? Stablecoins are DeFi. They yeah, do involve significant financial engineering, especially if they are something like DAI or RAI that tries to work without centralized external collateral. But they provide a service that's like very simple and dumb to the point where you don't even realize that it's DeFi, but you know, they are DeFi at the same time. Uh, Uniswap is DeFi, but it's just so simple and we've had it for like five years now, right? Um, Prediction markets are DeFi, but we've had them for five years. Like generally, I think uh, DeFi that we've ha had for four years is uh, generally a better kind of DeFi than DeFi that emerged in the last two years is uh, my general take, right? And, and you're not saying that that just because of how old they are. You're talking about there's a certain uh, kind of product that came out of the early cohort of DeFi that new DeFi is fundamentally just different from. It's not about the time, right? Exactly. I think, yeah. well, it's a product of the time, but it's not about the time, right? It's a product right. of the time because the applications that emerged uh, in the more old school period were applications that uh, really cared about providing like these specific forms of utility that are very queer to people and in this like very abstract way where they're queer, even if you're not part of the ecosystem already. Whereas the newer mm. stuff, it's like, oh, well, we're going to build a thing and you can liquidity farm it. And it looks like you can maybe get 11.4% APR interest. And, you know, hush, hush, we're not going to talk too much about whether or not the 11.4% APR is sustainable. Uh, so it just, uh, the newer stuff basically, yeah, tends to be more often justified by like short-term evidence of what it does. And that's a very bad epistemology in the DeFi space because it's just so easy to get short-term good performance by sacrificing long-term performance, right? Whereas the categories of applications that existed for four years, like if they did not have long-term value, people would have forgotten about them by now. Uh, so that, although I would say, yeah, like honestly, Four years ago, even the Ponzi's were more honorable. Like, uh, <laughs> what do you like, mean? Like, remember, that? you know, you know, there were some pretty sophisticated games four years ago, right? Where, uh, you know, there were the, the, these uh, experiments where people would like stick their money in, and then the first person to take their money out would lose some percentage, and though you'd have to like, mm. hold your coins in the system for longer than everyone else, or you'd have these games where. If you're the last person to touch the thing before no one touches it for 12 hours, you get a special reward. And like, it was just actually fun. It was like, it was like right. transparent. The Ponzi was transparent. Exactly. Everyone knew what they yeah. were doing rather like, than this fakery. 
Exactly. Well, yeah, so the, the game the, I'm yeah, pretty the, sure you're referring to is called Just Game, Just.Game. I think they'd actually <laughs> migrated to Tron because Justin Sun paid them to, but it was very explicitly <laughs> yeah. like this is a, a, Ponzi. a Ponzi. It was a Ponzi game, yeah. but huge emphasis on the word game. Yeah. It was a casino game that would be a great and awesome and fun casino game, and it made no intentions on promising any sort of outcome if you lost. And I think that's what you're talking about, Vitalik, is like it was more honorable in the sense that like no no one is like if you partake well, partake in it, like that's on you if you lost money. Exactly. Whereas the new stuff, it's like there's a lot of obfuscation. Like there's uh, often even layers of obfuscation going on. Like there is obfuscation uh, trying to uh, against VCs, obfuscation against regulators, mm -hmm. obfuscation against uh, token holders, against part early participants and late participants. And sometimes it's this kind of layered game where like, oh, everyone understands that this thing refers to this thing. And, um, you know, you have these arguments about like, well, why it has to be this way. But then the problem with that, with uh, doing things in that way is that it basically creates no way to distinguish uh, or no way for good projects to distinguish themselves from things where the thing that they're obfuscating is that their entire project is a pyramid scheme. And uh, like... The good, the good side of what emerged in 2021 basically turned out to be unsustainable and uh, ended up just kind of like slowly offering lower and lower rates over time. And the bad side of what launched in 2021 just ended up blowing up completely. So, right? so in both cases, it was over optimistic in terms of what it promised, but you know, one of the some of it degraded gracefully and some of it degraded very not gracefully. And so, uh, what I want to go back to is just more doubling down on and refining the uh, kind of fewer but really important ingredients that we have already known for quite a few years are actually really valuable and important to people. So you are still bullish on simple DeFi, uh, complicated DeFi, not so much. Can, can we go back to kind of the money for a second and just maybe from a, somebody who's outside the crypto industry's per perspective, like why are you why are you still excited about the money use case in general? Like, why do we need crypto money, Vitalik? Like, digital money, uh, a central bank digital currency could do that, right? We could we could scale out what um, PayPal is doing, or you know, um, some other kind of. Aren't you just talking about digital money? Why why is this crypto money uh, different or important? Well, I personally have uh, used like cryptocurrency as money huge numbers of times over this year right and uh, like for me the use case basically is like medium scale investments and charity donations right like uh, you know just sending a couple hundred thousand dollars to some uh, charity that's uh, you know giving money to poor people or supporting healthcare in Africa or so or somewhere like that uh, just like quickly routing money to medical organizations that are based in all kinds of countries. Um, these are, you know, investing in a, investing in startups. These are all cases where cryptocurrency is actually significantly more efficient than the uh, existing banking system. And like, I don't think that it's temporary. Like, I think that there's structural reasons why cryptocurrency is better at surviving as a frictionless international thing than uh, like fiat uh, traditional traditional banking systems do, right? And so I think it's actually is an open question whether or not CBDC is even will be able to compete against that in that same way, right? Like if uh, you know China launches uh, you know, DCEP and does a really good job of it, then like that could easily get a lot of adoption in China. But would people be willing to use it in Vietnam or Singapore? I don't know. Right. Mm. Uh, so whereas cryptocurrency, um, you know, is a thing that actually yeah, has like this very international reach already even today. Right. So that's one thing. Um, and that's just to be it's, right? it's kind of in a way trying to fulfill a very similar goal as the Esperanto language, which is like, mm. you know, F every single nation state currency uh, because of the borders. Uh, but let's make a brand new currency and everyone can use that instead. Exactly. Right, like for a uh, from the point of view of a country, uh, go a government um, having ten percent of your national economy suddenly be uh, uh, carried out in cryptocurrency is m much less scary than ten percent of your economy suddenly being carried out in U.S. dollars, right? Because in the second case, the U.S. government has power over you. In the first case, it doesn't. So mm. there definitely is this. Uh, 
structural aspect where because of its neutrality, cryptocurrency has an advantage that uh, fiat currencies cannot have, right? And like, there are countries that have a reputation for neutrality, but the problem is that all the countries that have a reputation for neutrality don't have scale. Once a country has yeah, scale, they, it they starts to have interest. By the, when the, when, if they do have neutrality, they get eaten up by the countries that don't have neutrality because the countries that don't have neutrality have the larger armies. Exactly. Right. Or potentially just like the larger economies and the larger will to kind of bully them into right. going along with the local bloc. I mean, these are right. things that happen all the time. Um, Certainly. Right. But that's just me, right? So like I uh, interact with lots of people around the world, but I, uh, you know, I'm still ultimately a uh, well-connected rich country person. But then if you go out away from that and uh, you go to, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, places in Latin America, Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and those kinds of places, like there, the financial system is often not even well connected to rich country financial systems, right? Like often enough, cryptocurrency just is by far the easiest way to send money home to people's families. Uh, cryptocurrency can be even the easiest way to make payments. It could be the easiest way to save money that is uh, much more guaranteed to not, uh, you know, drop by you know, like a factor of two every year for pretty much forever, right? Like, mm -hmm. there are a lot of places where existing fiat currencies are very unstable and existing fiat financial systems are very um, unconnected and where, you know, the banking system doesn't even necessarily even wants to connect uh, or wants to connect it, right? Like, basically, because there's just almost no incentive for them to. Uh, so those are the kinds of places where I think a cryptocurrency is just has clearer use cases uh, even today and uh, where I expect it's more valuable to succeed in the long term and where if you go to the places and you go to the meetups and you talk to the people, the culture there just feels much more genuine and more real, right? Like it's not talking about these uh, kinds of issues theoretically. It's, uh, you know, you have people saying like, hey, I'm from this country and in my country, there actually was a yeah, hyperinflation. And because I was able to put money into Bitcoin and ETH, I was actually able to protect my savings. And like, these are actual experiences that you regularly hear from people there, right? And I think a culture that is animated by those kinds of goals is just much healthier than a country where the like the thing that it's animated by is like oh look uh you know i have a thirty six thousand dollar monkey and that's my pass to get into some kind of elite new york city nightclub right? <laughs> it's like if i were to go to a new york city nightclub i'd almost want to let's see what would what, what one of an, out of a new york city nightclub one is that i would want it to open at 4 a.m um instead of closing at 4 a.m because i think people <laughs> who have the discipline to wake up in the morning are probably are, are possibly more interesting um i would want to ex possibly exclude people who have a monkey that costs more than thirty thousand dollars um or i you know like Pretty much the exact opposite of um, what the the New York City monkey scene is do is doing right now, right? <laughs> uh, so that's uh, you know the you know, you're just not going to get a uh, a great culture when you have people that just don't have problems for themselves personally that are uh, that mm. that that cryptocurrency can solve other than get getting rich off of other people's problems, right? Um, and so. Have like the cryptocurrency communities that are best, I think, are the ones that are not in that position. And like developing world is one example. And then I think another good example is like developed world, but, um, you know, the more like activist scene or like, you know, cer like c certain like, you know, industries that get deplatformed by banks and payment systems all the time and those kinds of things. Um, so that's, uh, you know, like those kinds of places are the places where I yeah, actually expect the most interesting work to happen over time. Um, and mm -hmm. those are the pl pl places that are, in a lot of cases, using blockchains and cryptocurrency already, right? And I think the main challenge there is that today, a lot of the time, people are using uh, cryptocurrency by interacting with Binance accounts. And it would be ideal if uh, these people had more de more decentralized options available to them too. And that's uh, 
one of the reasons why I'm, you know, really excited about the uh, social recovery wallet and, uh, you know, smart contract wallet and account abstraction ecosystem, uh, you know, why I'm excited about layer two te technology to bring fees down and, uh, you know, excited about privacy technology and all of these other things. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. TrueFi is DeFi's largest credit protocol, connecting global lenders with institutional grade lending opportunities. TrueFi has completed over $1.7 billion in originations and paid out nearly $35 million to lenders, proving that DeFi is ready to take its next big leap into the $8 trillion credit market. TrueFi gives lenders like you access to sustainable high yield opportunities backed by real world investments, usually reserved for high net worth individuals. At the same time, fund managers use TrueFi's financial infrastructure to bring their portfolios on-chain, benefiting from the global liquidity, cost savings, and transparency of DeFi. TrueFi is a decentralized financial utility. The protocol is owned and governed by the TrueFi DAO, and TrueFi is here to bring DeFi into the golden age, bridging the power and access of crypto with institutional-grade lending opportunities and portfolio tooling. Explore the diverse financial opportunities available on TrueFi or launch your own portfolio at TrueFi.io. If you've been listening to Bankless, you know that we're fans of the modular blockchain thesis. The idea that blockchains will separate execution from data availability and consensus, allowing all three to become the best versions of themselves. And Fuel has built the fastest modular execution layer in the industry. By supporting parallel transaction execution, Fuel unlocks significantly faster throughput for the Web3 world. Fuel also goes beyond the limitations of the EVM with its own Fuel VM which is more efficient and optimized, opening up the design space for developers. And lastly, Fuel brings a powerful developer experience with its own domain-specific language, Sway, and a supportive tool chain called Fork. With Fuel, you can have the benefits of smart contract languages like Solidity while adopting the improvements made by the Rust tooling ecosystem, letting the Fuel development environment go beyond the limitations of the EVM. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the show notes to see how you can get involved with the Fuel network. I want to hop back over to the uh, the DeFi conversation before we uh, tie a bow on the money and DeFi conversations and move on to the identity conversations. But uh, on the DeFi conversation, um, uh, we're in, it, to me we're in this like limbo period where we don't really know if there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of DAOs, a a brand new wave of DeFi apps, and one of the things that. Um, Ryan and I would previously communicate on the Bankless podcast uh, is that you know the DeFi, the application layer, the DeFi layer is always kind of the frontier. Uh, there, while there's not that many, uh, well, there's not that much room for layer ones and uh, layer twos out there. Like there can't be there can't be as many blockchains as there are applications. There will naturally be more applications than there are blockchains. And like kind of the uh, a large part of the wealth generation of the protocol layer is not like completely over but it's we've gone through that adoption wave like ethereum is half a half a trillion dollars or maybe a quarter trillion dollars um uh and and so like the one of the things we've communicated is that like the application layer is where a lot of the wealth is left to uh to create there's a lot of wealth creation on the application layer uh and so if it, maybe maybe you were too late to explore the the rise of the protocols but the rise of the applications will never stop coming right there will always be new applications on the frontier to explore uh, and that is where that's why some of the concentration of wealth in, in Ethereum I don't think is the biggest problem because the application layer is this natural diffusing mechanism because new DeFi apps new tokens tokens go up and down uh, and a new place to establish wealth but if we're if I'm if I'm now kind of considering that there's actually fewer DeFi applications than there really needs to be and in, instead of there needing to be thousands and thousands of DeFi apps there really only needs to be like 10 or 15 to really be comprehensive. Now I'm starting to worry that like uh, there is less churn and there is less uh, opportunity out there. Um, do you have any thoughts or reflections on this? 
there's definitely less low hanging fruit out there, right? And I think it, that's important to just recognize. And I think there's a huge amount of opportunity, right? Like if you can make a wallet that a billion people use, that's a huge opportunity. If uh, you can make a stable coin that can actually survive, um, you know, anything up to and including a US dollar hyperinflation. And, um, you know, Doge forbid the US dollar hyperinflation actually ends up happening, then, you know, that's uh, a huge um, up, up, uh, opportunity as well. If you can, uh, you know, create something that can actually, you know, be a lifeline for everyone going through that situation. Um, if you can get sign in with ethereum to work and you can like unseat facebook and uh you know google and twitter as the kind of login overlords of the internet that itself is a huge opportunity right and um, there's there are still huge things that are left on uh, um, on claims that still can be built but they're harder to build right like you can't just build um you know obfuscated casinos and get people to throw 13 million dollars in and just uh, have a fairly quick path to victory um so that's the the place where I think the space is in now. And I think the people that are going to be more successful are the people that are actually willing to put that kind of hard work in. Hmm. Next on your list of uh, applications that, that you believe in is identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a line in your article that I, I'd really like to, to pull out where you say, um, for, for a long time, I have been bullish on blockchain identity, but bearish on blockchain identity platforms. Can you unpack the difference between those two things? What's the difference between blockchain identity versus a, an identity platform? Sure. And so identity is a yeah, complicated term that refers to a whole bunch of different ideas, right? So like the concept of authentication, just proving that the yeah, identity that you are using to sign a particular message, to post a particular message, to send a transaction is the same identity that you registered at some point before, right? Even if it's totally pseudonymous, like even if it's a PHP public key, that is part of identity. Attestations. Um, I attest that, uh, you know, David at uh, Hoffman and Ryan Sean Adams are both uh, participants in this thing called Bankless. That's uh, part of identity. Um, the government of Canada attests that I have a telecomputer and I am a citizen. That's part of identi identity. Um, domain names or .eth names like Vitalik.eth, also parts of identity. Proof of personhood, proving that I'm a unique human and this is the only account that belongs to me in the system. That's part of identity, right? Like. Identity is this very nebulous bubble term that refers to all of these things. And sometimes when people say they need an identity solution, they might be referring to any one of those or any combination of them. And those problems are very different problems that, and they're problems that have very different properties. Like they have, for example, very different properties in terms of the level of centralization they might require in terms of the uh, level, uh, the extents to which the problems are social, um, the extents to which you can make a solution that works for a small number of people that doesn't grow beyond that small number of people. And th these are all actual use cases and they're all specific needs that people have. But the problem is that for the last decade, I've also noticed like this very abstract blockchain identity discourse where there were people that have been intentionally trying to create identity platforms. Like there are people that tried to create identity blockchains. And I'm by default and, you know, have been and still am very uh, not bullish on a lot of those, right? Because uh, basically they just trust have the mindset of starting from the point of view of identity as an abstraction, as opposed to starting from the point of view of a concrete set of use cases that people care about, regardless of whether or not they can later narrativize those identity, those use cases into being part of uh, some uh, grander space that they can call identity, right? It's like mm -hmm. meme first as opposed to problem first. And uh, problem first mm -hmm. is the approach that I think is uh, more viable there, and I think it's more viable everywhere. Um, and I think uh, Ethereum is the place where identity yeah, solutions in the sense of solutions to all of these specific problems that I uh, yeah, identify are happening and are pretty rapidly growing. I think part of your answer is that um, identity isn't something that you can go headfirst at. 
you can't make an identity app. You can't have an identity startup. Uh, identity is something that is emergent. It is something that is naturally composed from many different sources of inputs uh, that are that may or may not be able to interoperate with each other. Is that a fair assessment? Yep. I mean, it almost has to be like a byproduct of the thing that you're building, right? Like in in, mm-hmm. in a certain way, like um, wh- why is there sign on with Google or sign on with with Facebook? It's not because they started with the identity solution, but it's because Google made Gmail just so damn valuable in its app ecosystem, and so every like everyone has a Gmail account, and now you can use that to sign in. I, I I'm just wondering how you how you think like identity solutions. Again, we could have the Esperanto problem for just a microcosm of identity where we create all these great identity solutions. We're like, hey, world, come use it. And the world's like, we don't care. We'll just use English. It's fine. Um, Like, how do you think identity actually happens uh, as an export from the crypto world? Like, practically, how how does this bottom up uh, emergent Mm. thing manifest? I think you had it exactly right in that whatever the thing is that gets the network effect has to get the network effect for some other reason first, right? Um, One example that I think is good to zero in on is Ethereum wallets versus PGP keys, right? PGP keys like have for a long time been the number one like cypherpunk meme, right? Like we have a cypherpunk world when everyone has a PGP key and when people could use this uh, PGP keys to sign and encrypt messages to each and other. And that's been around since people, what, like the early 90s? Yeah. Mm-hmm. People tried really hard to have key signing parties and attest to each other and uh, you know, have PGP encrypted email and uh, even have all kinds of apps to make it easier and you know, all of these different overlay layers, but just uh, none of them have really worked well. And what has worked well? Well, guess what? We have Ethereum accounts now. And what is an Ethereum account? Well, it's a private and public key pair. And so now, guess what? Uh, you, you can sign into stuff with uh, an Ethereum key. You can encrypt stuff to people's Ethereum keys with a tiny bit of extra work. Right. And so you just get all of this uh, immediate benefit that's only possible because uh, you already have a user base of billions of people that have Ethereum wallets, which they got originally for like basically financial reasons, right? Because they wanted to hold cryptocurrency or or do uh, DeFi stuff and occasionally NFT stuff with it. So, one question I have about this model um, how I think it requires a significant amount of standardization across attestations on the and specifically the attestation side of things like uh, Vitalik attests that Ryan and David are are do this bankless thing. Uh, the uh, country of Canada attests that Ryan was once a citizen there. Sorry for doxing you, Ryan. Uh, America attests that I'm a citizen of America. Uh, Spotify attests that I'm a huge fan of the Sheepdogs. How do we do these things need to be the same standards or, or how do we make this uh, the identity of all of these different attestations all composed together so that we have like my identity rather than just like a bunch of disparate systems that don't really talk to each other? I think standards will emerge over time, right? Like the Pope protocol exists and uh, lots Mm. of people use it. And Pope, I think, has so far been more successful within the uh, Ethereum ecosystem than anything that calls itself an attestation protocol, right? Like they've, Mm. uh, you know, actually gone out there. They have the network effect. Lots of people have Popes. I have dozens of Popes. And, um, you know, the thing works and the thing is continuing to grow, right? Um, So Mm. that's the... uh, that's just like one example of something that I think is uh, succeeding. I mean, there, I think there's definitely room for a couple of other things to succeed as well. Um, and then at some point, they're going to grow to the point where they have to talk to each other. And at some point, they're probably going to agree on like aligning cryptographic standards or something like that. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get to something reasonably sane. Why is identity in the crypto space? It's a huge conversation. Uh, we all, everyone comes into crypto and they kind of get this vague semblance of an idea that like something about crypto has to do with identity. Then they learn about like, oh, my Ethereum address can represent me. Um, but why is this better than my nation state identity? What is lacking in nation state identities that Ethereum or, or um, private key identities really brings to the table? Like, why is this not a meme and why is this actually a good product? Mm. I mean, it solves uh, problems that people actually have, right? Like people, I I think, uh, obviously wants to have an identity in the sense of like just wanting to have 
an identifier, like a username that other people can use to talk to each other. Um, crypto, in addition to being a useful set of uh, products, is an ecosystem and a community, and people in that community want to talk to each other. So it serves that need too. Uh, people, I think, uh, want to be able to do stuff on the internet without that stuff being dependent on, um, you know, Google or Facebook or Twitter, uh, being uh, being able to do whatever they want with their account, or even just like seeing the yeah, if, all of the yeah, actions that they're taking. Uh, so there's this like queer value that I think speaks to things that people in the in the crypto space want to do and even to dreams that people outside of the yeah, crypto space have uh, ha have had for a long time right like this is um, you know making the internet more decentralized in a way that I think a lot of people have wanted to for like decades at this point um, and so I think it's uh, in a great place to actually get that kind of adoption. I think one of the one things uh, that really excites people about identity and crypto and, and uh, you know, really Ethereum sign this whole like sign in with Ethereum movement is that it's actually really easy to envision login with Facebook, log in with uh, Google, log in with MetaMask or Rainbow Wallet or or something. Is that is that the goal that we're looking for? Is that how, like when you said like the decentralization of the Internet? Is that one of the parts of the Internet that mm -hmm. we can actually decentralize with Ethereum? Is that like the explicit vision that you kind of have? I think absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, Bankless Nation, you got your work cut out for you. Look, Let's get man, this done. I think actually, I think on an identity, this is going to be seen as a big win for nation states. While there's a portion of nation yeah. states who are a little bit like, uh, don't step into the money thing. We have that covered. I mean, what what kind of um, nation state doesn't want um, the bot problem mitigated on the internet? And uh, to help identify who the hum who the humans are and who the robots. And by the way, the nation state answer to this is a social security number and a driver's license that you have to like and like a, a selfie. Come on, that is not internet native not at all. So there's some low hanging fruit here if we can do this. But let's talk about um, uh, DAOs for a minute, Vitalik. So we think about DAOs, the use case. You said you're still bullish on them. Um, are DAOs going to replace corporations? Uh, is there is there something less that that they will do? Why why are you still excited about DAOs as an application, and what function do you think they can fulfill? Yeah, so ironically enough, I think DAOs are well set to replace a lot of things other than corporations, right? Like corporations yeah. are actually yeah one of the forms that I kind of specified that DAOs are less likely to be able to replace, and. The reason for that is that I think uh, corporations benefit from the ability to pivot and the ability to pivot is like almost the inherent opposite of a certain type of uh, decentralization that people really want. But also corporations are not like they are big enough that they can afford to set up uh, like more regular infrastructure, like legal infrastructure and security infrastructure and so forth. And so they don't really benefit well from the other architecture, which is like, hey, let's just uh, not bother with that stuff and have a multi-sig of seven people, right? So my view is basically that, uh, you know, there's two architectures that make sense. One of those architectures is like, let's quickly speed up a multi-sig of seven people. And the other architecture is Hey, yeah, let's think really hard and create something that's like very credibly neutral, very able to resist all kinds of takeover attacks and use it to run really important stuff that we want to last for many decades, right? Whether that's ENS or whether that's uh, a stable coin um, or, uh, you know, something like proof of humanity or something like Kleros, like let's figure out how to make that extremely robust, right? So that's something where I think Adele makes a lot of sense. Um, and then the multi-sig of seven people use cases are use cases where I think uh, something that you could call a DAO makes a lot of sense, right? But it's like a DAO where you're not really emphasizing the smart contract logic, you're emphasizing more the decentralization of just like very open and spontaneous collaboration patterns that can be very agile between fairly small groups of people. And the smart contract side of things is actually pretty minimal, right? So. Those are the two architectures that I'm more bullish on. Architectures that try to do something else, I'm less bullish on, right? So, like things like you know, the like the original DAO trying to be a DAO that is a VC fund. Like, uh, yeah, the the more time goes on, the more I think like, uh, yeah, actually, that doesn't really make a huge amount of sense, right? In those kinds of cases, 
like you're getting the disadvantages of decentralization, which are that you move slower and that you uh, open up things that other people in a competitive environment can use against you. But you're not really getting too many benefits from decentralization e um, either. So like if you want to do that kind of VC fund, you just spin up a VC fund, right? Um, whereas, uh, you know, a DAO for like MakerDAO or a DAO for Proof of Humanity or a DAO for ENS, like that's something where that kind of value makes sense. And then a DAO in the sense of, uh, you know, a group of uh, five or seven people that just wants to like quickly collaborate without bothering bothering with a legal entity. Like that's also something that makes a lot of sense. And do, do you think, Vitalik, there's going to be some innovation in the governance structure of DAOs? Or do you think we've basically discovered all possible governance that, you know, that could work with DAOs? I think we need innovation. Um, so this gets into one of the other topics I've been really big on over the last year, right? Which is non-financialized governance, like governance that can uh, resist attacks from like say 51% of the to token holders or the token holders getting bribed or those kinds of situations. And I even argue that it's the financial use cases where definancialized governance is the most important, right? Like if you look at a stable coin, for example, like MakerDAO, it has, I think, uh, what, what, what were the yeah, stats? I think I had them in a post, uh, $7.8 billion of collateral, but the market cap of the Maker token itself is like somewhere around $500 million, right? And so... If MakerDAO really was governed by maker holders in an unrestricted way, then you could just go and buy up half the maker tokens and then use that to manipulate the oracles and you could steal a huge portion of all the collateral and that would just be a really big and, multi and uh, profitable multi-billion dollar attack, right? Um, now, the reason why that hasn't happened to MakerDAO specifically is because maker holdings are fairly concentrated and there's like maybe a dozen people that have more than half the total supply. And it just so happens that those uh, dozen people are kind of fairly aligned on the vision and they're, um, you know, either honest or at least they have enough other interests that would be yeah, really hurt if they did something like that, right? But in the long term, that's not the sort of thing that you really want to rely on, right? And so I think it's obvious that if you want a stable coin that scales, the yeah, collateral has to exceed the market cap of, of the profit-taking token and probably by even more than 17x. But if you want to do that, you have to have some kind of governance that's not financialized or some kind of governance where there's some kind of intentional friction or speed bump that prevents MKR holders or the token holders of the system from being able to quickly um, implement whatever goal they, uh, uh, they want and uh, take over the system. As you're talking about all of this, I, I just want to, you know, remind listeners to a, a, a bankless mental model that's at least helped me think through this. And this is like from games like Civilization that maybe some of you have played, where you have this concept of as you're leveling up your civilization, you have like a tech tree, right? And you have to learn the basics of like mathematics before many generations later in the tech tree, you uh, can build nuclear reactors with your civilization or launch someone to the moon. Like you, you need your math before you get your physics, before you get your nuclear reactors. And the question people have outside of crypto is like, okay, cool. You've been talking about this forever. How come you haven't done it? Well, think about the tech tree, right? You sort of need the money DeFi use case in order to build the network effect for identity to be valuable. And then once you have identity, you can start to tweak governance because some of the non-financial governance cases that you just mentioned really aren't very pop possible without uh, identity and knowing who's a human and who's not on chain. And so this is all kind of a big Ethereum tech tree that we're kind of building out uh, in, in parallel. That's what this reminds me of anyway, which which lends me to kind of the last uh, piece of, um, of what you wrote, Vitalik, this category for hybrid applications. What are, what are hybrid applications? Can you just like tease that out for us for a minute? Mm -hmm. Hybrid applications are applications that are not entirely on chain, but that benefit from being uh, connected to a chain, right? Um, so basically think of it as centralized services that use the chain and commitments published to a chain as a way to constrain their behavior and keep the system honest. Um, so the nice thing about hybrid applications is that they, uh, I mean, obviously scalability challenges basically don't exist with them, right? Like as long as you can make, uh, you know, ZK snarks that are powerful enough, you can uh, make some of these applications already. Um, so scalability challenges don't exist. Uh, privacy challenges are a lot smaller, especially if you can trust the provider. Um, and sometimes even if you can't uh, trust the provide uh, the provider even. Um, and 
the deployments challenges are much simpler because in a lot of these cases, it's not even something that requires changing the workflow of the user. It's like purely an overlay that runs on the side and only people who want to interact with the overlay have to, right? Um, so probably the simplest example of this actually is uh, making centralized exchanges uh, safer with proof of solvency protocols, right? Like if you have uh, exchanges that actually, yeah, you know, publish commitments to say the, yeah, all of all of their uh, user liabilities that's uh, and then they have assets on chain and uh, by having assets on chain they're proving that they actually have the assets that match the user liabilities like that is an example of an application that does use the chain and even uses cryptocurrency but it is also a centralized application and that application could keep the workflow of being a centralized application but still get a lot of benefits from being hooked into and kind of being shackled by the yeah, decentralized system um games are another example right like you can have game servers that are post the state to chain using zero knowledge proofs and that basically binds them to actually follow the rules uh, that they yeah, com uh, committed to. Um, the the Dark Forest game, right, is uh, probably one example of this. Um, voting, I uh, yeah, mentioned as an example, and there's many different kinds of voting, e voting, even going all the way down to something as simple as like Twitter polls, for example, right? Like you could imagine a blockchain-based Twitter, like Farcaster, say, yeah, as a, an Ethereum-based Twitter, like Farcaster, um, make uh, a, a, a poll where you use one of these fancy voting mechanisms uh, to vote in the poll and the voting is totally private. The voting is even coercion resistant and that's also hooked into uh, Pope uh, popes. And so you can limit the poll to a certain group of people, right? But then, well, Forecaster is like, I guess, not quite a hybrid application because Farcaster is aiming to be a decentralized system. But, you know, you could imagine something kind of centralized, like also plug those kinds of components in, right? And so you get kind of the efficiency of centralization and the uh, robustness benefits of uh, decentralization at the same time, right? So I think there's a really huge number of applications in this category, like on some level, almost anything can be improved by requiring it to submit routes to chain and uh, requiring it to be open about when it changes its rules, right? And that's just something that you can just like go and add on. And, uh, you know, it might not have benefits at first, but it might have benefits that appear years down the line. And just uh, the cost of doing it is in the long run so low that I think there's a bunch of applications where it makes sense. Yeah, I actually haven't really spent too much time thinking about this, but this is actually really uh, uh, kind of mind-blowing in the sense that it's actually doing some of the things that we're already doing in other parts of uh, the the Ethereum landscape. Like, what what do layer twos do? They post data to the Ethereum layer one that uh, forces uh, the layer two to to play by the rules, right? And this is kind of the same model for what you're saying. Uh, you can see so many other use cases. What is proof of reserves? It's a centralized company that's not really changing much else about its business, but it's posting data to a public blockchain that allows people to check on itself. And so you're just saying that. Uh, the general purpose utility of centralized companies, centralized teams, centralized projects, whatever, can just publicly post data to a chain that allows humans to check on whether that or not that company or team or whatever is doing the thing that they originally committed to doing. Mm -hmm. And really what is the original like ethos of a blockchain uh, to begin with? The whole idea of uh, a chain, a blockchain, is to like check on human folly, right? Make sure that humans are not being bad uh, and being able to verify that. Uh, and I, I think the the flexibility that this model uh, offers, which is just like, hey, you have a centralized company that requires human trust. Well, you can prove that trust with a blockchain. Uh, is like probably I think the most uh, broad utility broad uh, broad way to provide blockchain uh, assurances to the world that I can really think of. Yep, absolutely. That's the goal. Uh, so the broader question, I, I think really really the the reason how that will actually end up is just like at some point uh, the companies that do this are just have a competitive advantage versus the ones that don't. Uh, that's like perhaps like the capitalism market forces argument for why this will happen. But I want to kind of zoom back in into the near term and and also go into the one of the last sections in your article, Vitalik, which is how do we get there? Uh, and then a quote from your article I want to read is that the Luna market cap got over to thirty billion dollars while stable. 
stable coins that were striving for robustness and simplicity are often ignored for years. Non-financial applications often have no hope of earning $30 billion because they do not have a token at all. But it, it is these applications that will be the most valuable for the ecosystem in the long term and that will bring the most lasting value to both their users and those who build and support them. This paints this picture that all these flashy scams, like the Lunas, the Wonderlands, uh, FTX, will always get more attention and more adoption than like these boring, hardened, basic primitives that like crypto so desperately needs. And so this kind of lends itself a tally to like one of my existential crises I've been having recently is that like crypto might actually not be good in the short term uh, because it takes longer for these hardened real protocols to get built out. Meanwhile, we can generate like 10,000 APY Ponzi's along the way for three bull markets in a row. Uh, do you think that this illustration of crypto is true? And, and how, do you, how do you suggest that we accelerate the good things that we can take and show our moms? Uh, this is, uh, you know, where we get back to one of my yeah, points uh, a, a bit earlier, right? Like we have to recognize, uh, you know, our own agency, right? Like we, yeah, mm. I think all just needs to uh, work much harder at, um, you know, both doing all that we can to help those applications um, and doing, uh, doing less that we can to help applications that even if they look shiny in the moment are not actually all of the, um, all that meaningful long term. Um, you know, just uh, being willing to get excited about stuff other than making huge amounts of money. Um, uh, the, um, you know, organizations in the space um, can uh, do m much more to like, explicitly support uh, some of those projects, right? Like I, yeah, uh, like even just, uh, you know, giving grant, like, a few million dollars worth of grants to people who are honestly trying, like trying to make wallets that properly solve the self custody problem, right? Like these are you know, try to get to the point where like the yeah, uh, th how hard you have to work to get uh, to, to get funding as a wallet developer is like at least comes close to approaching how um how easy it was if you were just running a DeFi project. Um, I, it's just uh, also just like talking about the yeah. Just, some of the yeah, pr problems that uh, these uh, projects are solving and why it's why it's so important to solve them. Um, I think it's uh, the best that we can do for now is a, co is a combination of all of those things. Um, another important thing that I think is important for the, the space to do is uh, like continue the conversation with uh, regulators and not just in the United States, but uh, you know regulators around the world, right? I think it's uh, important to get out the message that like, what we as the Ethereum space want is not even necessarily a regulatory environment that's uh, friendly to everyone, but a regulatory environment that satisfies the requirements of being friendly, to, maximum friendly to, like, say, people building account abstraction wallets or working on zero knowledge proof protocols, but without being friendly to Duke One, right? And, like, what does that even look like? Um, it's, uh, uh, it's another one of the conversations that I think is uh, worth worth uh, having and trying to figure out right and, because i, I think uh, at this point the yeah you know well the political appetite to make an environment that's friendly to duke one is like definitely close to zero at this point right um and so i think it's uh you know important to kind of take the lead in the conversation of like how to be friendly to you know people making a kind of abstraction while it's specifically without being friendly to duke one and that's uh it's a more difficult one um and that's uh Definitely something that I'll keep thinking about too. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. By the way, I'd love to see a Vitalik regulatory post sometime on uh, Vitalik.ca. I, I think that would be a cool post. <laughs> um, Vitalik, thanks a lot. We we appreciate you coming on and talking about all these things. Maybe uh, just sort of final question on a little bit of a, a personal note. Uh, I'm I'm just curious for you. So we are ending 2022, entering 2023. Um, it's been a big year, certainly for Ethereum. A lot to be excited about. Uh, at the end of 2022, shipping the merge, all of these things. But um, wh what do you see your role in crypto as as we move into 2023 and 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 beyond? Yeah, you know the the old office space. What is it that you'd say that you would that you do here, uh, Vitalik? Like, what's what's kind of your role? How would you describe yourself? I f I feel like the answer is still some of everything, right? <laughs> like I think. Uh, now, that, that might change over time, you know, that but uh, that might be yeah, other things too, right? But for now, um, you know, it's uh, 
definitely some combination of uh, like increasingly trying to help projects that I like that are building good applications succeed and um, you know helping to explore and understand the application space better um you know still a lot of Ethe important ethereum protocol stuff better um and uh, you know participating in the discussion on like scaling um trying to kind of push the uh, evm in a good trajectory so it gets uh, you know functionality that people want without getting the uh, complexity that people don't want um trying to i guess continue to interact and connect with the various Ethereum communities around the world. I've uh, made it a goal next year to spend some time uh, vi visiting places that I uh, have uh, historically not spent uh, much time visiting. To, uh, visiting. I mean, that was my goal for this year too, right? And I yeah, did end up spending, I mean, you know, months in uh, Latin America, but I uh, don't know, next year, other places too. Um, so that's like, you know, right now, definitely some of everything and uh, some of just like, letting other good people um you know kids continue doing great work um and uh i guess uh helping the ethereum ecosystem move over to being a this uh you know, like a very stable and self and uh self-supporting thing that just keeps going forward on its own Vital on its like are you really trying to turn gas into mana is that really a thing it's a good question. I was ask, so, okay, so I have thought. What do you think of, the odds of your ability to do this? I mean, is I, I have thought about this, right? And I think like the one place where we could do that is in the context of multi-dimensional EIP one five five nine, right? This is the proposal where like instead of having just one gas limit, we have one limit for computation, and then one for like data, and one for I mean, maybe storage operations. Like one of the dimensions could just be called mana, and. Uh, no, no, I think uh, that would be cool and fun. I like, I, uh, I like Ethereum being fun. Uh, but uh, if it's going to be anywhere, that would be the place to, uh, the place where it is. But we'll see. That's awesome. Wait, was there a World of Warcraft? Was mana a thing in World of Warcraft? I don't remember my wild days. Yeah, yeah, mana yeah. is like the primary like limited resource for like anyone uh, using magic. This was the game all along. Vitalik wanted to create mana in this decentralized ecosystem all the way back to his uh, nerfed mm -hmm. World of Warcraft character. It's come full circle. <laughs> Indeed. Like, you know, you Vitalik, have Ethereum, a, uh... you have Soulbound tokens. Uh, <laughs> We're getting closer. You have, uh... mm -hmm. Vitalik, yeah. this is a, a Diablo Maxi podcast, by the way. Yeah, that it's you're true. On right it's true. You got to confess. <laughs> Got it. Still, still, still Blizzard though. Uh, same company used to yeah, be. Still Blizzard. Uh, yeah. Vitalik, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you guys too. It's been great. Action items for you, Bankless Nation. Uh, another fantastic Vitalik podcast. We've got a few more in the queue. We'll we'll uh, throw sorry a few more from the archive. We'll throw links to those in the show notes. Also, you got to read what in the Ethereum application ecosystem excites me by Vitalik. We'll include a link in the show notes. There's also another article I want to draw some attention to. It's an article that was posted earlier by the time you listen to this last week called from uh, astral codex 10 it's called why i'm less than an infinitely hospital uh, hostile to cryptocurrency why i'm less than infinitely hostile to cryptocurrency i think a great article from an outsider's perspective looking into the space and very rational uh, as as to which use cases have succeeded so uh go read those and uh, that's it. Got to end with this. As always, none of this has been financial advice. It never is on, uh, on Bankless, of course. Ethereum is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we're headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.